I think when we look at post Sandy and um, we look at we, we look to see the recovery and uh, the efforts that we're going through and a lot of the obstacles and you know certain other steps that people are trying to follow in uh, being able to rebuild or recover, repair, uh, even for the communities, not only for the homeowners, for, but for the businesses as well as municipalities. I think that there probably are some things that need to be addressed so we can find out what worked and what didn't work after Sandy. And, uh, you know, for me, I could see some things that for me, on my level, I'd like to see changed. But I think that what we need to now uh, is to start opening up a dialogue, especially with our offices of emergency management, all levels of government, to find out and come to an honest discussion as to what worked and what didn't work before, during, and after Sandy. Uh, for me, I'd like to see with our Office of Emergency Management that we reach out and we work with our first responders, especially our firemen, uh, to find out what did they face when they were there after Sandy and to find out like what is what do uh, rules have to be changed, do procedures have to be changed, what do we need to do uh, to even educate uh, the residents and the business owners so that they can better prepare for a storm and try to mitigate whatever damage can happen to them afterwards. Another problem that is, uh, seems to have been exacerbated by um, the, the challenges of Sandy has been, uh, you know, its effect psychologically on people. Yeah. And, and one of the ways that seems to be, uh, to have been brought to the fore has been through alcoholism and drug addiction. Yeah. Uh, um, has there, sometimes it's hard to see that there's been progress in addressing uh, these issues, uh, either locally or, or nationally or yeah. globally. Um, do you think there has been progress, or, or what can we do going forward on a, on a local yeah. level? Well, when I look at, uh, you know, numbers that we got, you know, from uh, statistics in regard to the heroin cases, we've seen an uptick since uh, last year, you know, by about 200, you know, cases that have been reported with people seeking help in emergency rooms. And, you know, so for me, I think that this may have been a problem that while we've been watching it um, has sort of escalated for whatever reasons, I really don't know. And perhaps it could be because of Sandy. Um, you know, so I think that it's something that maybe has not always been on the front burner in all of us minds. But uh, I think it's something that needs to definitely be addressed at this point and uh, with a comprehensive approach. What do you make of the, uh, the Facebook groups that have mobilized the public? Well, I have to say that I really was impressed, uh, you know, with, I think it's uh, RIP Long Beach, uh, you know, and I did attend that forum that was was held up at uh, the Bishop Malloy um, Hall up in Point Lookout. I believe Jennifer uh, was the young woman who actually organized this, and I commend her for uh, taking that first step, you know, for really addressing it and making us all become aware that we need to really step up to the plate and start working together as a group and trying to help understand the problem of addiction, uh, what heroin is doing to our communities, and like what are the steps that we need to do to start um, taking care of this and, and get, trying to get rid of uh, the heroin problem here in uh, Nassau County. It, it does seem that uh, there were several of these groups and there are several different meetings going on. Do you, do you think it, it, there might be some way of bringing them together? I think that that is, you know, and it's. Uh, I think it's normal for a lot of people to start speaking out and wanting to do their own thing. But um, I think that the best approach uh, to dealing with the drug problem is for everybody to come together on this, uh, you know, so that we take our resources, we can all work together so that the resources aren't stretched too thin. You know, we have uh, so much that we can do, but by being united in this war against heroin, it's the only way that we will achieve great success. And, uh, and I'm hoping that uh, these various uh, groups and different individuals will find themselves at the same table along with our police departments and all our levels of government. We all have to work together. It's the only way we will succeed. Like addiction, there's a uh, stigma attached to mental illness. And at the, at the event that we're referencing, um, the RIPLB uh, event, uh, there was a group and some eloquent speakers uh, linking the two. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, I, and I understand I was at the same meeting. And, uh, you know, for me, I guess we don't realize that with people who do have um, mental disabilities, I guess, uh, that they do require certain medications. Uh, they, If they're misdiagnosed, they're taking the wrong drugs. Uh, sometimes they do fall into where they're overdoing on 
prescription drugs or whatever, and then they might end up, if they can't get the type of placebo drugs that they need, they may end up with um, heroin. So, uh, but I, I can truly identify with that. I, we have um, family members that over the years have been misdiagnosed, you know, with depression when they really were bipolar. And a lot of the uh, problems and a lot of the things that they faced uh, because they were misdiagnosed was very, you know, very hot on them and on their families as well. And we also then have people who um, are, they have these problems or these, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the right word, you know, that do require, they may be diagnosed as being bipolar or medically depressed, um, and they're left to their own devices, you know, so that they have to get their own medication, they have to take care of themselves. And unfortunately, a lot of them, as soon as they start feeling a little bit better, they stop taking the medication because they think they don't need it, and then they spiral down into uh, the condition that they have. So uh, it tends to be a um, a cycle, you know, you know, for them, and it's a bad cycle. Um, there's an upcoming, um, I guess, it's a state senate bill, um, 4623, that um, uh, that would result in insurers being required to cover drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, and dependency treatment if it's prescribed, you know, appropriately uh, yeah. prescribed. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts about that? I have strong thoughts about that. You know, I think that, uh, you know, the insurance uh, companies have done a disservice to a lot of us. Uh, you know, we know with the level of addiction, you know, this 28 days, uh, you know, where residents go in and then they're booted out, you know, like whether or not they're cured or whatever, um, you know, I think is too short of a time. You know, years ago when I worked in the phone company, um, we had mostly, I guess it was more alcohol related rather than drug related. And at that time, a lot of the people that I worked with that had alcohol addiction, you know, in order to help cure them or help them to re in their uh, path to recovery, uh, they went out to South Oaks and the minimum, the minimum stay was three months. And in some cases, uh, it went even longer. So they actually treated the individual, you know, not, not necessarily the disease. So uh, they looked at this and knowing that uh, it takes a long time for people to come to grips with their addictions. And like we said before, people who do have, you know, some instances where it could be mental disease, that, um, that they do, it, that might be the outcrop because of that, they do then fall into this addiction of whether or not alcohol or drugs. And I think by doing at least a 90-day stay, they're able then to identify to see whether or not if the person does have a psychological problem that needs to be addressed in order to help them recover from their addiction. So I believe that, um, you know, for me, I would urge the state and the federal government to come up with funds and even to work with these insurance companies that we start seriously addressing this addiction problem and stop this because it's unfair to these families when they finally get their family member into treatment for 28 days to have them come out and I'm sure that it's probably more than 50 percent, it's not scientific, it's my opinion, that more than 50 percent of the people fall back into the drug abuse or the alcohol abuse and then the family has to go through the pain once again of seeing their family member abuse themselves through alcohol and drugs and then to go through the emotional upheaval of trying to find them a place that will take them for another 28 days. Let's stop this. Let's take, be responsible, let's be um, sensible, and let's be caring and compassionate and understand these people need help. That a lot of these programs may even require nine months to a year. Let's, you know, for me, I think it's worth the money and the investment. Why not? You know, you well, I think for us with law enforcement, I think that, you know, and this is something that I want to focus on. You know, unfortunately uh, for me, uh, you know, we have somebody that was very close to me that ended up uh, spiraling down into heroin addiction. And uh, it was very upsetting, you know, knowing that uh, this person told us about the place uh, where he or she, I don't want to give the, the sex of the person, would go uh, in order to score their drugs. And it was a house in Long Beach. And despite uh, calls over to the police department, you know, you just sometimes get the feeling that they weren't really taking us seriously, that maybe their drugs being sold there. So I think that um, in all fairness to all of us, that if people do have a uh, concern about uh, maybe a house that's close to them or that we know that maybe their drugs being sold, that there is a better way 
of conveying that information to law enforcement and to also get them to at least take a look at this and, uh, you know, like not always try to protect the landlord, but let's start protecting the children that are vulnerable to these drugs and these, these drug sellers. Well, that's the same person ended up, you know, they were able to get into a drug treatment and they went upstate for a year. And it was like a work farm or something like that. And this, thank God this person. Therapeutic was, community, maybe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is what we need to do. We this need to start opinion. looking. Yeah. We need to start. Uh, we have to be serious about this. We really and truly do. For me, it's demoralizing, uh, you know, for the families and the stress that the families go through. And, and then even the children that are not the drug abusers are being impacted, you know, by the fact that they have a brother or sister that is a drug addict, and that drug addict has taken all the attention of the parents away from the children that are not. So it, for us, you know, it, it's time that we really start looking at this and we start saying to ourselves, are these children worth the fight? And I hope everybody says that they are.